Dia 27 de agosto, você médico poderá participar de um evento sobre a nova era no tratamento da obesidade. Cadastre-se em novonordskacademy.com.br e atualize-se com as últimas descobertas da ciência e obesidade. Evento destinado exclusivamente a profissionais de saúde habilitados a prescrever e ou dispensar medicamentos. Você que está ouvindo o seu podcast e curte fazer um bom negócio, vai aí uma dica imperdível. A nova Chevrolet S10 está na sua melhor versão, bruta e macia ao mesmo tempo. De um lado, toda a força e potência de uma picape bruta, invocada e conectada. Do outro, todo o conforto que só a nova suspensão proporciona. Muito mais macia e silenciosa, deixando suas viagens ainda mais confortáveis. É a nova S10 que você conhece e confia ainda mais bruta. Brutalmente macia. Acesse chevrolet.com.br para saber mais. Estou passando nesse podcast para dividir uma informação que fez toda a diferença na minha vida. Quer fazer pós-graduação, mas tá impossível correr de um lugar para o outro? Pois é, ainda mais com o trânsito. Então você precisa conhecer a educação à distância do SENAC. Sabia que é nota máxima no MEC? E tem diversos cursos de pós-graduação para te levar ainda mais longe. 100% online, sem necessidade de TCC e com acesso direto a todos os professores. Ah, saber isso fez diferença sim. Inscreva-se já na pós-graduação EAD. Quer saber? Senac EAD. I'm Jason Pack, and this is Disorder, a podcast where we want to find out what is going on underneath in the deep evolutionary recesses of our minds and our cultures that play into our mad, 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 mad world. I tend to believe that humans and governments can be naturally collaborative. It's not obvious if you look at the world that that's the case, but there's some really interesting scholarship that's been going on over the last two decades that shows that ingrained evolutionary patterns that have emerged and root us in things like tribalism, superstition, and conformism, they could play to the negative for division, but they also have aspects of solidarity and collaborations. To tackle these paradoxes and try to get to how our shared cultures and shared biology could be used to help us order the disorder, it's a great pleasure and honor to be joined today by Professor Harvey Whitehouse. I've been tracking Harvey's writings for over 15 years. I've been fascinated by his fieldwork in places as far flung as Libya, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, and that most tribal of societies, the U.S. of A. Harvey is the director of the Center for the Study of Social Cohesion at Oxford University and author of a brilliant new book, Inheritance, the Evolutionary Origins of the Modern World. Welcome to Disorder, Harvey. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me on the show. Your colleague, Oliver Scott Curry's research has shown that cooperation is judged to be morally good nearly everywhere on planet Earth. It forms the bedrock of this thing, a universal moral compass. Wow, that's such an exciting realization. Could you tell us how people discovered that? Did that challenge what they thought previously? Well, Oliver Scott Curry, as you say, is the originator of this wonderful idea that there are seven forms of cooperation that are judged morally good everywhere. I teamed up with him, collaborated with him and one of my former students, uh, Dan Mullins, to establish how universal those principles of cooperation and the judgment that they're morally good really is. How universal is it? So we took a sample of 60 cultures around the world that were selected to represent as much diversity as we could manage. And we analyzed the writings of anthropologists on those cultures in as much depth as was possible to do so that we could establish when scenarios arose, where these forms of cooperation became salient, whether they were judged morally good or bad or neutrally. And we found that in almost every single case, all seven of these principles of cooperation were judged morally good. Now, obviously, they could be applied to many different circumstances, and that doesn't mean we all have exactly the same moral norms, obviously not. But we do have the same fundamental 
moral predispositions and orientations. And this is a really important finding. It means that morality is not just a cultural construct. It's not just historically contingent. It's something fundamental to human nature. And I think that the Greeks understood that. We may have lost it because there's an obsession in monotheistic religion that God gave morality or lots of other stuff like this that cloud our judgment. But am I right in saying that the ancients, not only the Greeks, but ancient Semitic peoples and in China, they might have felt similarly? I think very broadly speaking, there have been some real shifts in which of these seven moral domains gets the biggest emphasis in the societies uh, that have existed in the past. And if you don't mind, I'd like to read the seven principles for our listeners, just so they know what we're talking about. The seven principles of universal morality that Harvey is drawing on from Oliver Scott Curry's work are, one, help your kin, two, be loyal to your group, three, reciprocate favors, four, be courageous, five, defer to superiors, six, share things fairly, seven, respect other people's property. And I think all of those seven won't sound alien to people who are thinking about them. Please continue. Thank you. They're not alien to any of us, actually, because they are built deep into our sort of moral intuitions and and shared by all of us. But they have been emphasized differently through world history. And I'm going to speak rather crudely in broad brush terms here. But I think with the rise of the Bronze Age civilizations, the first city states, we see certain features of the seven moral domains becoming somewhat amplified and others being tamped down a bit. So we see a massive increase in the emphasis on things like uh, respect for authority and for things like the importance of kinship and family and loyalty to family. But with the rise of what's sometimes called the axial age, during that sort of phase in world history, there was a bit of a turn away from that kind of emphasis of the that portion of the moral repertoire and more emphasis, at least ideologically, if not in actual practice, on things like reciprocity and fairness. I think there has been a shift. I think what's happening rather tragically in the modern world is that some of our moral commitments are being amplified in certain ways for certain groups that then become siloed. For example, I did a study, collaborated with some colleagues of ours in Poland, to look at how the seven moral domains were emphasized on different sides of the debate over abortion. And we found, for instance, that people who were pro-life tended to emphasize those bits of the moral repertoire that, (laughs) thinking about it right now, are actually more like those that, that I was describing for the Bronze Age civilizations. Whereas those who emphasized the sort of rights of the mother to have an abortion were more likely to emphasize loyalty to group, actually, to the sisterhood and to womankind and their rights. So these are different components of the moral repertoire. We all recognize them. They're important to all of us, but they get emphasized differentially. And social media and other factors have helped to um, result in a sort of polarization of our moral commitments. I think the reason that none of these seven moral principles are alien to anyone is because it's quite apparent that they make humanity quite well suited to form large-scale trusting organizations for collaborative tasks. In other words, if our universal morality was every man for himself, it's absolutely best to kill someone and take all their stuff, we would have gone extinct way, way, way long ago. So it seems fairly obvious that the humans who evolved very different non-collaborative principles, they went the way of the Neanderthals, right? And that this is just, this is evolution. These are the things that allow you to form large-scale successful societies. Yeah, I mean, I certainly think that uh, modern humans have these evolved features of cooperation built into our evolved psychology. But I think that evolved psychology uh, was there to support cooperation in very small groups. It wasn't designed to support cooperation in much, much larger groups like the, the kind that we live in today, really big, complex societies. And so a key question really is, can it be scaled up to support cooperation in much larger scale and more complex societies? And uh, let's think about just an example of this for a second. If, for example, we were able to be loyal to a group in a small face-to-face society where everyone knew everyone else, 
that might enable us to survive in competition with other groups when we come into conflict, or it might help us to hunt big and dangerous animals more effectively without uh, people defecting or free riding on the efforts of others. But how do you scale that up to a situation where people can cooperate in whole countries, in complex states and in uh, international agreements on various matters? How can you scale up cooperation to that level or even perhaps to a global level? Well, a big chunk of my book is about how that was achieved over the last 10,000 years and the various ways in which our ancestors managed successfully in many cases to harness our natural biases in ways that facilitated cooperation and collaboration on ever more, ever larger scales and in more complex societies. But I don't think we can just take it as read that that happens automatically. And the sad thing is that as technologies have been advancing at such an incredible rate in recent decades in particular, many of our culturally evolved mechanisms for managing our biologically evolved biases have been failing us. And it's very difficult for us to adapt those techniques to the very fast changing world we now live in. I think this is the key point that we're going to keep coming back to throughout this pod. It's that the ways of thinking about collaboration, which were really well suited for early nation states, can now be used by ethnic entrepreneurs to foster intergroup competition, or they lead us to wanting to have strong men to unite the in-group against the out-group. So this is the mismatch between us evolving from hunter-gatherer bands to having very much the same DNA and cultural values in dealing with super large societies now facing global problems, right? Yeah, so I I think that's right, that um, many of our evolved biases do get hijacked and exploited by bad actors in the modern world. And examples surely include those forms of populist leader and authoritarian leader that spread fear in the population at large in order to encourage support for strongman type leadership, for hawkish and xenophobic attitudes, and for loyalty to uh, groups in opposition to other groups. So these are all divisive forces in society that are being exploited on a very wide scale at present. I think an insight of these seven moral principles and, and how you write about the inheritance that we all have is to grasp that the neo populists couch their appeal in ways that appeal to our biology. In other words, if we're afraid, we want this strong man leader. I think it's a, such a, a, a profound and interesting question why we favor strength in a leader over so many more potentially obvious uh, desirable qualities. And we have some very interesting evidence that relates to this and, in fact, to the developmental origins of it. We've known for some time, thanks to a, a range of bits of very interesting psychological research on pre-verbal infants, let's say babies who haven't yet learned to talk, that even at that very young age, they expect physically formidable individuals to win out in competition over contested resources, right? So they expect strong men even before they can speak, to dominate socially. But we've also uh, run some very interesting experiments showing that this same logic applies when pre-verbal infants observe an agent that seems to have some kind of supernatural power losing against a natural agent. This surprises them because they're expecting the supernatural agent to win in competitions like that. This part of the book so struck me that when I was in Sweden last week visiting my best friend, he has a two-year-old. And of course, it's the terrible twos and he's screaming and this, that, and the other. And when he's carrying on, we put on a YouTube video of airplanes. All of a sudden, he's entranced by the airplanes. You see them on the runway, they're going, they take off. And he stops screaming and he looks at the airplane. And then we went to the airport, he's pointing into the air, airplane airplane. And I was just thinking about your book the whole time, Harvey. I'm like, why is this kid so obsessed with airplanes? Oh, airplanes defy the laws of intuitive physics. Hence, a 27-month-old knows that there is something quasi-magical about an airplane, and he forgets that he's upset 
with the fact that he had his bicycle taken away with it from him, he's hungry, he was screaming about something, because the magical airplane, which is a socially superior being, is now on the YouTube screen, and he looks at it and he just says, airplane, airplane. <laughs> and he points and goes, airplane. And this really unlocked this for me, Harvey. Why kids, they just love things like trains and airplanes. They defy what you call intuitive physics. They want to either worship them as gods or defer to them as beings which are obviously superior to their father and mother and should deserve deference. <laughs> well, the amazing thing is uh, they have this expectation about solid objects falling earthwards uh, well before 27 months at a much, much younger age. And in our studies, 12 months old found it very gripping to see a very, very simple image on the screen of an individual crossing a stylized kind of valley without having to go down one side and across the bottom and up the other side by simply floating across. This kind of intuition that objects, including agents, should obey the laws of gravity is incredibly early developing and violations of that expectation lie at the core of so many of our concepts of the supernatural. And it's not just intuitive gravity here that we're talking about, it's principles like object solidity, that objects, if they meet each other in space, should displace each other and break, they shouldn't pass through each other. And big objects shouldn't be able to pass through little holes and that kind of thing. Think of Santa Claus, a perfect example of something that violates both of those principles. He's, he and his uh, sleigh and his uh, reindeer can all fly. That's defying intuitive gravity. They can pass through uh, tiny uh, apertures like a chimney, which seems should be impossible. And they have these other features that violate uh, the expectations of, of very young children. Of course. And M Moses parted the Red Sea. And right. Muhammad magically flies on Buruk his horse yeah. from Mecca yeah. to the farthest mosque, Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. So these stories of magic really appeal to people and then they lead to a kind of deference that you want to give to the person who's performed the magic. I think that's right. And it's very interesting, isn't it, that this intuition that somebody who exhibits the power to defy these basic physical expectations should also be socially dominant in an interaction with another agent emerges so very early in development. It suggests that the reason why we defer to figures in society who associate themselves with supernatural powers of various kinds, who uh, appeal to us through their charisma and their claims to supernatural legitimacy, managed to wield so much power in the world. And it's no surprise, I think, that so many people we're starting to hear are treating Trump following the attempted assassination, more and more like some kind of messianic figure. So we've talked about the negative now of how this biology is hijacked by neopopulist leaders. How can orderers and our new crop of mega ordering leaders like my main man, Sir Keir Starmer, use our existing evolutionary biology to prioritize people's impulses to collaborate and share because we have these other impulses in us where we really want fairness. And I think in Britain, there is a very strong culture for fairness. Hey, he cut the queue. We're not into that. Do you know what I mean? We've seen how because of this British sense of fairness, oh, they partied when we were at lockdown and I couldn't go to my own grandmother's funeral. We have this fairness impulse. We have other impulses. How can mega ordering leaders play on our existing biology in as sophisticated a way as the neo-populists use it for division? Well, I th that's a great question, isn't it? I think the neo-populists tend to exploit our loyalty to particular groups in a highly divisive way in opposition to other groups. I think what we need from Keir Starmer and from leaders who are capable of uniting rather than dividing us to cooperate more effectively in the interest of all. What we need is people who can play to our evolved psychology in ways that recognize our shared interests. And also, and this may be a little counterintuitive, but it's worth explaining, our shared experiences, the things that define us as individual people, but which are also defining potentially for much, much larger groups. And 
leaders who are able to show that experiences like that that can unite us exist on both sides of a conflict. We call these kinds of leaders barrier crossers, right? And they're barrier crossing leaders because, among other things, most importantly, they recognize that the experiences that define the in group that they may have grown up in and which they may represent. Those key experiences are also shared in important ways by members of out groups, even traditional enemy groups. And understanding that lays a foundation for being able to cooperate more effectively with those groups. So, this is as true for a divided society as it is for the relations between、uh, states that are at war or engaged in some kind of、uh, conflict. In a way, this takes us back to our episode on empathy with. Dr. Claire York, which you can check out via a link in the show notes, and it explains there that the successful interfaith leader, if he's say a Muslim or Palestinian communal or religious leader, he understands that although we may not grasp why these Jews or Zionists feel the way they do, they feel as persecuted and attacked and under threat as we feel in our group as being. Attacked and under threat. Therefore, although we don't agree with their narrative, we can meet with them, and we can commiserate in a shared way. Similarly, if you are a European leader, you might not love the narrative of some other leader, but you get that he's trying to support his people who feel that they've been, you know, hard done by globalization, just like your people do, and it requires a certain empathetic approach. That it's almost shocking that more leaders don't have right because this is like it's not that difficult to make that intellectual leap, but once you've made it, you can then do the things that you're talking about. I think it's a very interesting point, and we have、uh, done some empirical research on this question of whether the ability to take the perspectives of others is an important feature of barrier crossing leaders as we conceive of them, and. So far, the evidence is not straightforward on this. It looks, for instance, at least in one study that we've published, we've shown that at least in terms of their self-report, how they see themselves, barrier crossers don't rate themselves as necessarily better at perspective taking than their barrier-bound counterparts. And what seems to be really important is not just recognizing that people have grudges on both sides or have issues on both sides or see things in ways that are. Justifiable potentially on both sides. All of those things may be very good, but the really fundamental thing about the barrier crosser is that they recognise that experiences of a very powerful kind, the kind that are transformative and life changing for the individual, and which、uh, they share with their fellow group members, and which is a very powerful basis for cooperation, are also experiences that the out group have gone through. Let me give a concrete example of this, focusing on Gaza for a second. So we ran a study with、uh, Americans who identified with Jewish or Muslim faiths, and they were invited to listen to a speech that was presented by a friend of mine. He originally presented this speech in the House of Lords, but I asked him if I could rewrite it a bit and put in it a lot of emphasis on the sufferings experienced on both sides of the conflict in Gaza, and then have people listen to this speech. And what we found is that after listening to it, it moved people in such a way that they increased their level of alignment by certain measures, which we can talk about, with the outgroup, and improved their attitudes towards the outgroup in ways that we might re- reasonably expect to lead eventually to a more positive approach to peaceful outcomes. And this is just a little speech that they listened to, and we measured them again after a delay of a few days, and found. That much of the effect was still there, so it lasted, and that's just the effect of a little speech. So imagine what we could do with politicians who give far more impassioned and frequent and moving speeches of that kind that emphasise suffering shared on both sides. From your mouth to God's ears, what we've been preaching on this pod is the value of leadership. Every time I'm on with a brilliant author like yourself, and we had Jamie Metzel on weeks ago, I just feel. Oh wow! The reality is that if you get into the meaning of these ideas, it's that we have failed on the center left to choose the communicators, to weave the great narratives that Bill Clinton and Tony Blair would have done if they were in this moment, and we've just completely, completely failed. I agree. 
And I think one way we can look to a more effective kind of leadership for the future, particularly for those kinds of leaders that we need to bring us together and to build cooperation more successfully, not just within our countries, but regionally and globally, is we need to look to our ancestors and how they accomplished that over thousands of years of world history. A lot of the leaders we see today, the Trumps and the Putins and the and various leaders that we see, are really what you might call big men. And big men were the typical kind of leader across a lot of Papua New Guinea traditionally until really quite recently. And big men are a certain kind of leader. They're very good at dominating the people who live in their communities. And they do that successfully by pushing and cajoling people into following them and getting certain kinds of benefits in return. And they do it by exercising strength, by a certain amount of bullying, by demonstrating certain achieved qualities, if you like. But they also do it by being effective statesmen who can claim, at least, to be protecting the group against its enemies. Okay, big men are an effective kind of leader in a certain kind of level of social organization, if you like. But they're not good at creating lasting, enduring, and large-scale cooperation. Because, for one thing, when a big man dies or loses his grip, another big man comes along and takes over. So whatever faction they've got supporting them then sort of dissipates and a new faction is built. And so it's difficult to build up a really large scale society. And the way we got around this in you know, the evolution of social complexity was by creating a new form of leadership, which we commonly refer to as a chieftainship and which has sort of evolved into various forms of more regal kinds of leadership, is a kind of leader who has something that in Polynesia they call mana, who has a sort of uh, characteristic that allows them to, to claim respect not only on what they do, but on who they are. Now, that's a very alien concept to the democratic world, but it's an important idea to understand because some of these leaders who have mana also have inherited and ascribed characteristics that are present in their line. So they pass them down. And that means that their authority can be inherited. Now, obviously, we live in a world where this is not a congenial idea and not one that I'm recommending either as a solution. But it points to the fact that there is a kind of leader who doesn't need to bully and push people around in order to get respect. They get respect because they have this thing called mana. Now, obviously, it could be construed in terms that require some kind of hereditary form of authority. We may not want that. I don't think I'd want it. It may be associated with forms of ideas about the supernatural that we might not want to buy into. I certainly don't want to. But there are aspects of mana that I think are important. They have to do with charisma. It's one thing to be a big man and to push people around and get a certain amount of things done for an in-group. But for a barrier-crossing leader, I think I look to people like Nelson Mandela, leaders who have charisma as well as Uh, the ability to get things done. And I think charisma is an important quality that we need to look to in leaders. I want to pivot from this to how the decline in religiosity may have made our societies less governable. You write in Inheritance, quote, eventually our beliefs in the supernatural would compel us to submit to rulers, to pay them their dues and to fight their wars. In broad brushstrokes, I see that with some degree of religiosity in society, and it doesn't need to be just Catholicism or Islam or the Church of England, but religiosity broadly construed, people are more governable and are willing to enlist like they did in World War I, you know, millions enlisted to fight for the cause. And now because we're in such a capitalist, post-neoliberal, it's about the me and my identity and the this and the that, You just can't get people to give up their cars or to do trash pickup or to do whatever. There just isn't enough religiosity to do the collectiveness that's needed. So given this, is part of the reason that it's difficult to get people to collaborate and they're more thinking about the me, me, me in the in-group is we're just not as religious as we used to be? I think Our innate religiosity hasn't really changed, but it's being exploited by very different agents in the world right now. Instead of being exploited by large organizations that, broadly speaking, are contributing to the reproduction of larger scale forms of cooperation in society, it's actually being used by commercial interests to sell us products. So a lot of the stuff that 
a lot of the stuff that I associate with our evolved religiosity is actually being utilized by the advertising world to sell us products. A lot of those products we don't need. A lot of those products are leading to unsustainable forms of consumption. And they're not really helping us to live more cooperative and more successful lives. They're actually causing us to destroy the Earth's resources at an alarming rate. Uh, what we need is more ways of regulating those features of our evolved psychology uh, in ways that actually serve our collective interests. I like the idea that religiosity and rituals can be used differently. Studies of rituals show that they are remembered more when they evoke more fear, when they are more symbolically laden, and when they galvanize certain emotional responses. Now, we've always had these kind of rituals. Democratic countries used to use, I think, more effectively rituals at graduation ceremonies for the police and military academies. Sports teams use hazing rituals or celebration after the Super Bowl or the premiership is won. What can we do to make these group bonding civic rituals play on our inherited biology to make citizens of democracies feel fused together, even with people of different ethnic backgrounds that they are sharing the same civic space with? I see a lot of potential here that's not being unleashed. I agree. I think there's a lot of potential here. In fact, we have a new paper out um, reporting on a study we did of people who participated in or observed the Queen's funeral. Now, whether or not you're a monarchist, uh, you have to acknowledge that this was a very, very powerful ritual. And the potential is there in rituals of this kind to do extraordinary things. Unfortunately, it's not well harnessed in the ways that we might like. I think the same about football, actually. I spent a lot of my time working on cohesion within football fandom and with other groups whose intense, passionate commitment to the group is never really leveraged in a way that could be good for society. And I've got quite involved in projects that try to do exactly that, to try to find ways of taking this social glue and applying it to things that would be really genuinely useful. And it may be that it's a lesson that we had and lost. I studied global and imperial history at Oxford. And one of the things that you learn when you're reading about the British Empire is how meaningful the monarchy component was from dealing with the Senussi Sufi order in Eastern Libya to dealing with various Indian potentates in the Raj to dealing with tribes in Nubia and Sudan and elsewhere in Africa. They could understand this is the monarchy. And when there were various jubilees and events and they might get to meet the monarch or go to London or whatever, it's something that people grasp and allowed them to be connected. Yes, it was hierarchical. And yes, there were things that were unjust about how the non-white peripheries of the empire were treated differently. But people could relate to it and symbols were wielded that fused people together. I think that this is crucial. So after the break, we're going to talk about identity fusion. Mega Orderers, wanted to tell you guys about another podcast that I really like, The Jordan Harbinger Show. We're really fortunate to have Jordan as a guest later this year. He is a superstar. His show features in-depth interviews with some of the world's most fascinating minds. And what Jordan brings to the pod is a cool, calm Californian energy talking about tech regulation, but then also relationships and some self-help advice. He also speaks with some of the most fascinating minds out there, like Jamie Metzel and Bill Browder. It's really a must listen for any of you mega orderers out there. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We're back from the break with Professor Harvey Whitehouse, and we're delving into some really exciting, interesting, curious things. And what you didn't think we were going to discuss is football hooligans, but I personally, there's nothing I there's love no more than Libyan militias. 
I want to map them. I want to order them. I want to understand how they relate with each other. You've done some work in Libya. Could you tell us a story or so about how you, as someone who understands intragroup bonding, were even shocked when you witnessed the phenomenon of how going through shared suffering or a powerful experience together has led to a human behavior that shocked you? Yeah, I, I was actually quite shocked and surprised by the data that we collected in Libya in 2011, the year of the uprising, because we already knew that identity fusion was an incredibly powerful form of group bonding. Perhaps I should explain what uh, fusion is and how it's measured very briefly. The way it's measured is you show people using a pictorial measure, a picture of two circles, a small circle that represents you and a big circle that represents your group. And you show pairs of small circles and big circles arranged in a series so that they uh, have differing degrees of overlap. So at one end of the spectrum, you have the little circle and the big circle completely separate. And then the little circle is slightly overlapping and then slightly more overlapping in a progression of depictions until in the final depiction, the little circle is completely contained within the big circle. And people who say that the best representation of their relationship with the group is captured by the one in which the little circle, that's them, and the big circle, that's their group, is the little circle is fully contained within the big circle. We say those people are fused with the group. And people who choose that description of their relationship to the group express a willingness to fight and die for the group if necessary to protect it. The trouble is, when we were studying fusion, we were using hypothetical measures of willingness to fight and die. And when the Arab Spring kicked off, it presented us with the first opportunity really to go into a situation where very large numbers of people were actually laying down their lives for one another. And so we had a measure of fusion and we knew that at least hypothetically, people were willing to go to great lengths to protect their group and in particular to fight and die, at least in hypothetical scenarios. But we'd never been able to test that theory in a situation where people were actually placing their lives on the line for one another. In 2011, that opportunity arose when it was possible for me and colleagues to get into Libya and to run our fusion measures with fighters in the battalions that prosecuted the war against Gaddafi. And there we were able to measure fusion levels with a variety of groups, including family, fellow fighters in your Katiba or your, your fighting unit, and uh, people who fought in other battalions who you didn't know personally, and people who supported the revolution but weren't actually members of any of these battalions. And what we found were ceiling levels of fusion with the people who had fought in some shape or form in the battalions and with family. That's unsurprising. But we found floor levels of fusion with people who were on the same side ideologically, so actually supported the revolution, but didn't engage in the fighting. I think, though, that what was genuinely really surprising to me was that up until this point, we'd measured fusion with various groups all around the world. And the clear winner, it seemed, in pretty much every case I could think of was family. Like the primary group that people everywhere are fused with, if they're fused with any group at all, would be their family members. And that's partly because of the way in which people become fused in the, in the first place. And I wonder, though, if that's not true with people who are fundamentalists. In other words, if you are very, very fundamentalist, not just as a Muslim, but as a Jew or a Christian, you could be as fused with the religious group as with your family because some aspect of fundamentalist religion has you place the religious group above the family. This is a very interesting question, and we have collected data with religious fundamentalists that have some very interesting findings on this. But this was a rare example, actually, of pitting fusion with various different groups against each other. I'll just explain how we did that in this study design. So we said to people, OK, we appreciate that you've scored very, very high in your fusion levels with multiple groups here, which include family, the people you fought with in your own Katiba, people from other Katibas you've, who you didn't fight with personally, but who fought bravely in the revolution. But if you had to pick one, which would it be? So this was a forced choice question. And here we found a very interesting result because we compared a population that was composed half of frontline fighters who experienced the most intense uh, horrors of the war and people in the same battalions but who didn't actually experience the frontline combat because they were providing logistical support in the form of driving ambulances and fixing vehicles and doing that kind of thing. And here we found a 
striking difference. If you were a frontline fighter, you were more likely to choose your fellow fighters over your actual family. Whereas if you were a, a front, uh, if, you, if you're a provider of logistical support, you were more likely to choose your family members. So to find evidence that there's this strong correlation between frontline combat experience and high levels of fusion, this was a really striking finding for us. I think it's very relevant in Gaza and Israel, and that it's something that is not surprising. The history of humanity is that when you begin to fight and bleed and die with people, you're then mystically fused with them. You want to marry their daughters. You want to then engage in business ventures together, and you're willing to do amazing acts of heroism and altruism for them. You will understand better how this has come about culturally and evolutionarily. I just know it to be the case, you know, having having been in so many war zones in my life and been in 15 or more Arab countries and been in Iraq, I, I've just seen this to be the case. And I think something else is also going on, which is that societies that go through those kind of conflicts, and we've seen this now in Ukraine since 2014, but particularly since 2022, is there's social pressure to feel these things. Some Ukrainians are like, well, actually, I care a lot more about my daughter than I do about this conflict. But the external social pressure is that now in the Ukrainian milieu, it's really important to say, these are my brothers in arms and these are my people. And that's a healthy aspect of how warfighting societies use social pressure and rituals and bonding to impose the esprit de corps needed to win. Uh, that makes sense to me. And, you know, we, we did after the study in Libya, we did studies with other military groups finding that, and this was important to do because in Libya, we weren't really sure whether this was a purely, this was a purely correlational study. So we weren't really sure where the causal arrows lay. Was it that, you know, people were more fused as a result of their awful experiences on the front line? Or was it fusion that drove them to the front line in the first place? So we designed a combat experiences questionnaire, which we ran with military units uh, who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we basically measured how intense people's experiences frontline combat were. And importantly, these were groups of people who had no control at all over their deployment. So what couldn't have been fusion that drove them to the front line. And intensity of combat experience was driving the fusion outcome. So this was important in terms of unpicking what is causing what in these scenarios. My discussion today with Harvey about identity fusion may not appear immediately connected to how our world is disordered, but I would argue that it is. How combat and struggle affects our emotions, this is a fundamental human truth. It's baked into our evolutionary biology, and it's something which is drawn upon by orderers and by disorderers. It's something that we need to acknowledge in how we make public policy to order the disorder. So next week, in part two of my interview with Harvey Whitehouse, we're gonna talk about how combat and shared trauma can be used to bring people together and how phenomena like identity fusion and nationalism can actually be reconfigured to be used as an ordering rather than a disordering force. Well, that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed hearing from Harvey as much as I enjoyed interviewing him and reading his truly amazing book, Inheritance. The links to that book are in the show notes. But before we go, Mega Orderers, we'd love to hear more of your questions. Alex and I have really enjoyed doing these listener questions, episodes, chatting about things from Ukraine to climate to the Caribbean to sperm counts to whatever's on your mind, however you want to order the disorder. So please write us at disordershow at gmail.com. And in September, we're going to do a bang, bang listener question episode where everyone who writes in, in response to this call, will have their question answered. As I've said a few times now, next time we'll have part two of the interview with Harvey Whitehouse. So tap follow on whatever podcast app you use to listen so you don't miss it when it drops. As always, our producer is George McDonough. Our executive producer is Neil Fern. And finally, we hope you have such an orderly week that it is replete with identity fusion with those you care about.